Good morning and welcome to the Heritage Foundation to our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. Of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to check your cell phones and see that they've been turned off as a courtesy to our speaker. It's always appreciated. And I know the speaker's been warned, but I will tell some of our heritage interns that think lunch has to start at 1145. We'll make sure you have lunch for the 12 noon event downstairs, and I'll apologize to David if you're delayed from up here. We, of course, welcome those on the internet who would like to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org, and we will post the program on the homepage following today's presentation for everyone's future reference. Hosting our discussion is Jennifer Marshall, who serves as Vice President for our Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity. She oversees Heritage's research and a variety of issues that determine the strength and character of American society. She also edits one of our newest publications, the Heritage Annual Index of Culture and Opportunity, which will have its second issue coming out later this summer, which tracks key social and economic trends to determine whether important indicators of opportunity in America are on the right track. Prior to joining us here, she worked at Empower America, and before that, she was a senior director of the Family of Family Studies at the Family Poli uh, Research Council. Excuse me. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Marshall. Jennifer. Thank you, John, and thanks all of you for being with us today for a very important topic. We have all been stunned as conflict in the Middle East has engulfed innocent civilians in very violent ways in recent months. And it's been particularly shocking to see the Islamic State in particular target religious minorities, Christians, Yazidis, and others. And our visitor today has returned from going to Iraq and meeting with a number of refugees of this current crisis. So we're eager to hear from him about how they fare in the situation on the ground there. Bishop Michael Nazarelli is a longtime friend of the Heritage Foundation. He has visited, visited us several times over the last decade and has helped shape our thinking about how to interpret uh, political and radical Islamism uh, and how the West should re respond to it. Michael Nazarelli was Bishop of Rochester in the Church of England from 1994 to 2009. He was born in Pakistan and he later served as Bishop of Rywind in Pakistan. He holds both British and Pakistani citizenship. Since 1999, he has been a member of the House of Lords, where he's been active in a number of areas of national and international concern, including issues concerning marriage, human dignity, and many others. Bishop Michael is an influential commentator on the rise of Islamism, and he travels widely as a prominent spokes uh, spokesman for a meaningful engagement between Christianity and Islam. He's the author of 10 books, and I have two of them here to show you today, uh, Con Conviction and Conflict. And his most recent book is called Triple Jeopardy for the West, Aggressive Secularism, Radical Islamism, and Multiculturalism, topics on which he is very well versed and, and has an important leadership role in helping uh, Britain and Europe and the West contemplate these issues for us. He's also the president of OXTRAD, which stands for the Oxford Center for Training, Research, Advocacy, and Dialogue. So please join me in welcoming Bishop Michael Nazarelli. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you uh, once again uh, for the hospitality that uh, Heritage uh, have extended in the past and are extending uh, also today, I'm very grateful uh, for these opportunities uh, to address very important issues in our world today. Uh, as uh, Jennifer has just said, I have returned from uh, a life-changing visit, I suppose, to northern Iraq this time, which uh, I had not visited before, though I know central and southern Iraq better uh, from past visits there. But what I want to say is not limited uh, to Iraq. Of course, we will look at that. Uh, but this is a general situation uh, in the Middle East and beyond, which we need to consider. And I really want to begin with a conversation I had with an Iranian official a few years ago when I was in Iran. And as an opening gambit, just as I've had to think of an opening gambit this morning, I thought I would say something about Cyrus, because 
the cylinder of Cyrus, when Cyrus became uh, the ruler of Babylon uh, as a Persian uh, dynasty, began a Persian dynasty, he issued an edict of liberation for all the people in his empire. And that cylinder, which is usually in the British Museum, had been lent to the National Museum in Tehran uh, at, at the time I was visiting Tehran. So I thought I would begin by saying uh, to this Iranian official uh, and his assistants, uh, what a great tradition of tolerance the Irani people had, referring to Cyrus and his cylinder. And he looked at me and he said, um, Bishop, we are not interested in the past. We are only interested in the future. And I thought that was um, a sad comment because unless nations recognize their past, it is unlikely that they will be able uh, to think about their future in any effective way. And Iran, of course, has such, such a glorious past. But the cylinder of Cyrus is not alone in traditions of tolerance in the region. There are many other examples uh, can be given. Uh, even Constantine and the so-called Edict of Milan, which had a huge effect on the region that we are thinking about, was not in any way to privilege Christianity. It was actually an edict about religious freedom for everyone. Uh, and that goes back to the fourth century. But early in the fifth century, another Persian uh, emperor, and in those days, of course, the empire of Persia extended into what is uh, now Iraq, uh, the emperor Yazdegerd also issued an edict of toleration uh, for all his subjects. Um, the prophet of Islam, uh, when he entered Medina, uh, promulgated the so-called Sahifat al-Medina, the constitution of Medina, in which he gave um, equal recognition to the Jews and the different uh, Muslim communities within, uh, within Medina uh, as to their rights and to their responsibilities. Uh, very often people say to me, we want an Islamic state you know, in this country or that country. And I sometimes, anyway, say to them, uh, will it be like the first Islamic State? And if not, why not? Uh, this year, we are celebrating the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. No doubt there will be celebrations here in Washington because how much that has affected your own polity here uh, is another charter for uh, human freedom. Uh, that we need to take seriously. So there are these traditions of tolerance in our world today in so many different cultures and from so many different times. So the question that arises is why are these freedoms uh, so um, widely flouted um, in so many parts of our world? Why are they not respected? Um, why don't we have high interest in Cyrus in today's Iran, for example? Uh, what are the reasons? And there are a whole number of different reasons. So sometimes it is just good old-fashioned tyranny. Um, I've been concerned a great deal in the past five years or so with the situation of Christians, particularly in Eritrea, where first evangelical Christians were targeted, uh, the most incredible treatment, they were locked up in containers in the desert. Uh, you can imagine what that did in the heat of the day and the cold of the night, uh, floggings, um, torture of different kinds. And then the Orthodox patriarch of the Orthodox Church disappeared, and now the persecution extends also to Roman Catholic Christians. Uh, the lesson, I suppose, from all of that is that if something happens to one of you uh, and not to me, I shouldn't remain silent because I may then be the next target, of course. But in Eritrea, uh, the reason is simply good old-fashioned tyranny uh, of a dictator uh, who has become megalomaniac, um, uh, megalomaniacal. Um, that continues. We have to deal with uh, 
with tyranny of that kind. Sometimes it still uh, is the case that we, uh, that Marxist ideology uh, causes the persecution of Christians and other religious groups. Uh, this is still the case in China, whatever else we may say about China, um, particularly people from the underground churches uh, and those Catholics who want to recognize the authority of the Pope are still subject to uh, persecution, to imprisonment, uh, to exile, uh, to their churches being demolished. Uh, some uh, Catholic bishops have spent almost their entire episcopate in prison or under house arrest. Uh, we mustn't forget them. Um, and this still inspires mistreatment of Christians in places like uh, Laos and, and other places. Having said that, the, the Muslim member of parliament in Britain, Rahman Chishti, uh, has said in a number of, um, uh, of his speeches that 80% of the persecution of religious minorities is now happening in the Islamic world. Um, and the question is why this is so. Why is 80% of the persecution of religious minorities happening in the Islamic world today, if Chishti is right? And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, there has been widespread resurgence in the Islamic world of different kinds. Now, there are positive aspects to this resurgence. Um, I know um, many people, uh, for example, in Indonesia, there is a very large a Muslim organization called the Nahadat al-Ulama al-Islam, and they are, um, they are people who have worked to maintain the multi-faith nature of Indonesian society. Uh, Chandra Muzaffar, a convert from Hinduism to Islam in Malaysia, and Anwar Ibrahim, the former uh, vice president of Malaysia, who's unfortunately now in prison, but I've known him since he was a youth leader. I was a, a youth leader of Christians. You, you see how time goes by. <laughs> and he was the youth leader of the Muslims and um, uh, had a good vision for Malaysian society. And I'm sorry that it has ended like that. Uh, Sheikh Ali Goma, the former Grand Mufti of Egypt, uh, whose very progressive fatwa on the law for apostasy, uh, I think will continue to be influential uh, in the future. So there is a, this positive side to the uh, resurgence, but there is also a negative side. There is another side, and we are seeing more and more extreme examples of that side. This is characterized uh, mainly by looking backwards to the seventh century, not simply with nostalgia, but with a detailed uh, social, political, and even economic program. Um, this is what constitutes the core of many uh, Islamist programs, uh, whether Shia or Sunni, in our world today. And uh, this backward looking, I mean, that is what Salafi means, by the way, is to, is to look back uh, at what has gone before. Uh, this backward looking uh, attitude or set of attitudes, I suppose we should say, uh, is characterized by certain things. It has great suspicion of any diversity. So diversity is only um, recognized, if at all, uh, by being very strictly controlled. Uh, this, of course, extends to the presence of other faiths uh, in society other than Muslim, but it also extends to a non-recognition of certain kinds of Muslims. So the, the Sufi shrines uh, in Mosul have also been blown up alongside the churches, as have the Shia mosques. Uh, it is characterized by a hostility to the West, uh, and the Crusades are often invoked uh, for that hostility, that continuing hostility. And 
there is a hostility particularly to Christianity. And you may say, well, why Christianity? The reason is, I think, that uh, Christianity and Islam are now the two uh, great missionary faiths of our day. You know, whether we like that or not, that's the fact. Uh, and people are finding themselves cheek by jowl with one another, um, and uh, sometimes that leads to peaceful coexistence, but sometimes it leads to horrible conflict, as we have seen rec recently. Some uh, Islamist organizations claim either to have renounced violence or never to have been violent at all. So the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt, uh, claimed for many years that they had renounced violence. And I believed them. Until, of course, more recent events showed me and everyone else uh, that under certain conditions that wasn't the case. The Tablighi Jamaat, uh, you kindly mentioned that I was Bishop of Raiwind in Pakistan, and Raiwind is not really known for anything. It certainly wasn't known for its bishop. <laughs> Uh, but it is known for one thing, it is the international headquarters of the Tablighi Jamaat, which is a, a, an organization, uh, I suppose it's a preaching organization. And um, they have always claimed to be nonviolent. Uh, they are Islamist in their orientation. And again, uh, I have believed them when they have said this. But the question is, even if these organizations are nonviolent or have renounced violence, can someone who is exposed to a particular interpretation of Islam within them, can they then go on to something else, to a more violent um, extremism? and a commitment to organizations that become more and more violent. I mean, there is this phenomenon of mutation that we have to take seriously, that um, what may be non-violent Islamism can and does mutate into more violent forms. And what are we going to do about that is the, is the question. Uh, the West, of course, had um, a love affair with the so-called Arab Spring. Actually, there was no Arab Spring. Um, or if there was, it was really, in cosmic terms, negligible. Uh, there was really, and there continues to be, an uprising of Wahhabi Salafi elements in many parts of the Muslim world who saw the unrest that there was about employment, for instance, about opportunities for the young, uh, as, uh, um, as a moment that they could seize and, and did seize in many ways. But the question about uh, democracy has therefore arisen. Uh, the, que the, 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 the question is, um, is it enough to take power uh, at the ballot box? Um, or is the real question about democracy a willingness to relinquish power? And as far as Islamism is concerned, the jury is out on that. Um, you know, it is easy, relatively easy to take power at the ballot box, but what happens afterwards? Uh, is there a willingness to give up power? Uh, we could give uh, many examples uh, about this, um, but in the case of Egypt, uh, for instance, um, I was saying, and many Egyptians were saying at that time, that democracy is not enough, because democracy can lead simply to uh, the tyranny of the majority or even of the voting majority, which is sometimes different from um, an actual majority. So in Egypt, what was needed uh, at that time was a Bill of Rights. 
uh, the equality of all before the law, one law for all, a common view of citizenship, um, so that uh, groups like women, I mean women are not a minority of course, but uh, so that groups like women were not consigned to a second class status, uh, that uh, Christians and others who had uh, acquired uh, common citizenship with their Muslim neighbors uh, over the last a hundred years or so would not lose it, would not return back to the dhimma, to being uh, protected uh, minorities and not equal citizens. Uh, all of that was needed. Now, in fact, the new constitution in Egypt goes some way towards that. Uh, it recognizes uh, freedom of belief, for instance. Although it recognizes freedom of belief for everyone, uh, it recognizes uh, freedom of practicing the cult, public worship, only for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So, I mean, that's good for the Christians and for the small Jewish community, but of course, in my view, that doesn't go far enough because uh, if freedom of belief is recognized, then that should go further. Uh, in recognizing also uh, the freedom to express uh, our beliefs in public as well as in private. Um, some people, particularly Western commentators, uh, say that uh, Islamism is caused by social and economic factors. I think this is misleading. Uh, it is certainly the case that people can be recruited to radical Islamist causes uh, because of social conditions. So the large cohort of young men in many of the Arab cities, uh, whether it's Algiers or Cairo, who have had enough education to know they're not getting uh, what they think they should be getting, well, of course they can be recruited in this way. Uh, to radical causes. But um, radicalism uh, in this sense flourishes in oil-rich states as well as in poor countries. Its leaders are well-educated people, particularly in the professions, uh, who are not poor. Um, it is true that they recruit from the poor, not just the urban uh, masses in the big cities, but if you take the case of the Taliban, uh, on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, uh, well, uh, the word Talib or um, Taliban means student or students, and these were people who were sent to the madrasas, to the religious schools, because their parents could not afford anything else. Because of the abject failure, uh, for example, of the education policy of the government of Pakistan. Now, um, they were then radicalized in these madrasas and became the fodder for the radical movements in Afghanistan, whether it's the Taliban or the Haqqani group and uh, various other groups uh, that emerged. Some people say, some Muslim leaders and even some Christian leaders have said that if there was a truly Islamic state here or there, then that would result uh, in a recognition of freedoms uh, for non-Muslims and for women and so forth. Now, I would like to believe this, but in fact, if I look at the history, I have to say that I don't think that any such thing would happen, uh, yeah, to, be, to be quite honest about it. So what has happened? I mean, um, let us take Iraq, uh, from where I've just returned, uh, whatever the merits of the action against Saddam Hussein um, by the West, um, we now have a situation of a radically disordered society um, where all the civil institutions have disintegrated uh, the political parties are really only 
uh, people defending their self-interest. It doesn't seem that they have a wider vision uh, for the country than that. And this has resulted uh, in a number of Islamist movements arising uh, and then mutating. So, uh, the Islamist movements that arose immediately after uh, the fall of Saddam, uh, for instance, the Ansar al-Muslimin, or Ansar al-Islam, I think they were called, uh, many of them have mutated into either Al-Qaeda type organizations or into ISIS. Um, as, a, as a response to a, a disordered society, to the lack of a political vision um, uh, for the country, and of course infiltration from, from outside. Now, uh, before the invasion in Iraq, for many years, um, the West operated the no-fly zone, you remember that? I actually once sat in an aircraft that, that did the, you know, that enforced the no-fly zone. And it, was, it was a very costly thing to do uh, in all sorts of ways, not least for the pilots who were doing it. But the, what the no-fly zone did do was to prevent the genocide by Saddam and by the Ba'ath Party, firstly of the Marsh Arabs in the south, and then secondly, of the Kurdish people in the north. Um, this was a real achievement. Uh, if, that, if, th if that had not happened, we, we don't really know uh, what the situation with the Kurds, for example, would have been like today. So in my recent visit, um, to Iraq that has been mentioned, I was mainly in the northern part of Iraq, uh, mainly but not only in what is known as the Kurdish Regional Government, the KRG. And um, I must say uh, that the, the KRG appears a well-organized um, territorial entity. Uh, almost an independent state. I mean, they have their own borders. Uh, the way you enter the KRG is different from how you enter Baghdad, for instance, in terms of visa policy. Um, and uh, their commitment to secularism. Now, we may want to question that, but I asked again and again the leadership of the Kurdish uh, people and indeed the leadership of the Peshmerga, whether they were Islamic. And in every case, uh, sorry, am I doing something? I, uh, I think you're all, we'll sort that out in the sound booth. In every case, the answer I got was no, we are not Islamic. Um, well, uh, that certainly is a relief to, to some people there. But um, one of the things that um, must be mentioned about the KRG is its hospitality uh, that it has shown to the very large numbers of refugees. Uh, we cannot deny this. Uh, I had expected a fearful uh, a rag bag of refugees with low morale, with uh, living under very bad conditions and so on. This is not, in fact, the case. And there are two reasons for it, two main reasons. Well, I suppose the refugees themselves and their attitudes, but apart from that, there are two main reasons for this. One is the hospitality of the KRG and the relative safety that they have provided the Christian, large numbers of Christian, Yazidi, Shabak refugees within the KRG. This is uh, very admirable uh, in a region like that for a government uh, to provide such hospitality to such large numbers of refugees who may well change the identity of the KRG because most of the refugees are not Kurdish. Um, secondly, uh, what has... Um, what has uh, given the refugees uh, this uh, sense of hope is the work of the churches. 
Uh, I know the media doesn't talk about it, uh, but uh, the, particularly the work of the Chaldean Catholic Church, the Eastern Rite Church to which most uh, Iraqi Christians belong, uh, uh, has been um, beyond criticism. I mean, I, you know, it's extremely well organized, uh, and they have delivered without discrimination to refugees, uh, whether belonging to their own denomination and even uh, to those who are not Christian. So a Yazidi leader said to me, um, in Doha, actually, he said, um, our faith does not have the structures to help us in this situation. The church has the structures and has helped not only its own people, but also ourselves. I think this is just uh, something for the record. Uh, as I've said, the morale of the refugees is certainly high. Um, and having visited many refugee camps in the world on many occasions, of course, refugee camps uh, are places where people live under hardship. Uh, but given that, I think that the KRG and the churches generally have uh, tried to provide as much as they can to these refugees in terms of food and shelter and basic necessities. Now, uh, we still need um, emergency help for refugees. Uh, shelter, there is... Uh, people are still living in containers, which they made very nice, but <laughs> nevertheless, they are containers, uh, where the church uh, has been able to rent flats for people. There are three families to a flat rather than one family to a flat, so the huge overcrowding. Unused buildings are used. Uh, I mean, they're used now, but they were unused before, if you see what I mean. Uh, and again, uh, the facilities are very basic there. Uh, the provision of electricity, for instance, is always a challenge. Most of it is provided by generators. Uh, so that material need continues to exist. But I think uh, in addition to that, there are social needs that are arising. Education for the children. I found that the younger children were m mostly in education, but the teenagers were not. And I think that is dangerous. A teenage boy is not in school. I mean, you know, that's a recipe for trouble in the future. Um, I believe that there could be uh, a very good initiative in cooperation with the KRG and the churches in providing micro-enterprise opportunities for families, men and women, so that people can earn their living. Uh, some of them are earning their living with working outside, uh, in the general community, uh, but many are not. And I think idleness, uh, indefinite idleness, cannot be good uh, for people. So I'm hoping that some kind of partnership can be developed uh, for micro-enterprise uh, amongst these refugees. Many of them, well, s some want out. Some want to leave Iraq. They feel they have been betrayed even by their neighbors, particularly the ones who left Mosul. Their properties have been occupied not always by ISIS, but by their erstwhile neighbors. So it is very difficult for them to trust people again. And I, I, I think that is um, a reasonable uh, thing for them to, to believe and to say. Uh, but many of them don't want to leave Iraq. They, some of them want to go back. And some of them will, I think, stay uh, in Kurdistan um, in one way or another. The question is what to do about those who want to go back. Uh, they will not go back without protection. And again, I think that is quite justifiable uh, for them to believe. And many of them, many of their leaders have said that for a limited period, an international force 
is necessary to protect them as they go back to their ancient homelands, particularly in the plains of Nineveh. Um, it is not necessary for such a force to be Western or Western-led. Uh, I give the example of the African Union force in Somalia, which has been quite effective, um, supported by the international community, uh, but not a Western force. However such a force is conducted, I think something like that is necessary. Um, if Iraq is to survive as a nation, and again, we don't know whether it will, but if it is to survive, then there has to be a broadly based agreement between the largest communities, the Shia and the Sunni, about the future of Iraq. In that agreement, the minorities, religious and ethnic minorities, must be included and mentioned. They have too often been betrayed. I mean, the Assyrians have been betrayed again and again by the powers, including Britain, I have to say. Um, they have been promised things in times of crisis, and when the crisis has passed, they have just been forgotten. Uh, this must not happen again. Any new settlement must recognize the Yazidis, the Christians, the Shabak, the Mandeans as having a future in Iraq. Um, Afghanistan uh, has had um, intervention again uh, from the West. Uh, huge intervention. This has had some positive results. I mean, the place of women in society, um, the way in which children are being educated, particularly girls, I mean, all of that has been positive. Um, most recently, uh, the conviction of those people who murdered the woman who had been accused of um, uh, desecrating the Quran, uh, that has been a courageous thing for the judiciary to do, to not to let the, the people who lynched her off, off the judicial hook. But there are still problems. Uh, some years ago, a man called Mr. Abdul Rahman was sentenced to death because he had converted to Christianity. Uh, I know some of the people who drafted the Afghan constitution. And um, I said to them, you know, the West has spent millions, billions of dollars in Afghanistan. You have drafted this new constitution. How can it be that even in this day and age, Mr. Abdul Rahman can be sentenced to death for apostasy? And he said to me, this is a progressive jurist in Afghanistan. He said to me, Michael, we've done our best. We have even incorporated in the preamble to the Constitution the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But, he said, no one can trump the Sharia. Now, there's a question for you. No one can trump the Sharia. This means that whatever you do, wherever you do it, uh, in the Islamic world, uh, certain kinds of people with certain kinds of interests will always uh, try to negate any progress that has been made uh, in this particular way, by making this particular move. Uh, this is also the case uh, with Pakistan, with the blasphemy law, which has been a dead hand on free speech of all kinds, whether by Muslims, uh, or by Christians, particularly uh, for the Christian community. Uh, we've had uh, one case after another uh, now for a quarter of a century, uh, on many occasions false accusations. But again, uh, the, um, the response to any amendment to such a law, uh, to any change in the way in which uh, it is enforced, uh, is resisted on the grounds uh, that this is divine law that cannot be changed. So what are we to do in, in such a situation? And I'll end with that. 
I think at the level of public policy, uh, we must, of course, begin with diplomacy. And uh, diplomacy uh, can have an effect. Um, in the case uh, of Iran, for example, I think it is a mistake simply to concentrate on the nuclear question. Because whilst there has been progress on that, and that matter can be debated, in fact, in its domestic policy, Iran remains a severely repressive regime. And the question is, can you trust a regime that treats its people in this way uh, at the international level? Indefinitely, I don't think you can. Well, you know, whatever the practical politics of an agreement on the nuclear issue. Um, unless Iran becomes a more open society, unless it respects the freedoms of its own people, indeed the freedom of its own president. You know, Iran is the only country in the world where, the, where President Rouhani's own speeches are censored. Well, how can you, how can you trust um, a country internationally uh, that is behaving domestically like this. Now, there have been a few movements. Just before I left, I received uh, a little of a niggle of encouragement uh, from the regime that there may be some movement towards greater freedom um, for its people. Uh, but we have to, to, to watch that uh, very carefully. But diplomacy... Uh, does have an effect. Um, I mean, uh, the, the British government uh, has been uh, giving uh, 600 million pounds to Pakistan for education in the last three years or so. Well, excellent. Uh, but the question I asked British ministers was uh, whether they would discuss with the government of Pakistan the teaching of hate in the textbooks uh, your own center here for international religious freedom has documented very ably this teaching of hate in the textbooks. Uh, in the context of receiving this huge amount in aid. And the answer I got was, well, maybe behind closed doors we could have a word with someone or the other. You know, this is not good enough. This means that British aid could well go towards the propagation of the teaching of hate rather than its elimination. So this is completely absurd. So diplomacy in this sense, whether in the hard or the soft sense, does have a place. Secondly, I think there is a place for sanctions, not just for regimes that are violating um, international relations in one way or another, but also in terms of their domestic policy if they are engaging, for example, in genocide, uh, or even if they're not engaging in it, if they are simply uh, encouraging it in one way or another, or systemic discrimination against a group of people because of their religious beliefs or their ethnicity. Uh, these sanctions can be carefully targeted, uh, and they can be selective, uh, but they can work. I have already mentioned in the in relationship to Iraq uh, the necessity for a force of protection if the Christians and the Yazidis are going to return return in large numbers to their homeland. Well, I think um, um, what is true of Iraq may also be true in other places. Uh, very often in northern Nigeria, I know it's not a region we are discussing today, but in very often in northern Nigeria, uh, people are afraid to go back to their homes because of the ineffectiveness of their own security forces. I'm sorry to say. So, um, action to protect people who are exposed uh, to genocide of one kind or another will become uh, a topic that we will need to give more attention to. Um, personally, uh, I mean, as, as citizens, what can we do? Uh, I think giving, I was very struck in Iraq 
by how generously people had given uh, from all parts of the world uh, to, the, to the refugees and how much that had contributed uh, to their survival and to their well-being. Uh, so I found, uh, for instance, uh, some Indian sisters from Kerala, Indian nuns from Kerala, doing medical work. Well, they've come from India to do the medical work in Iraq, but actually the resources that they are using, they have come from all over the world. And we need partnerships like that um, uh, in our giving. Um, there is no substitute for going, you know. Uh, I mean, what I'd been sold in the media about the condition of the refugees was quite different from what actually I found. Uh, and uh, we, so I think personal interaction, going if you can, uh, going with teams if you can, many charities will take teams uh, to such places uh, and take the opportunity. It's not, uh, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, it's, it's not safe but it is good. Uh, so, so do go. Uh, and then campaigning. I think do campaign with your governments, with your legislatures, uh, with policy makers, uh, join in with agencies uh, that are campaigning, that are lobbying, uh, the international uh, organizations, um, the United Nations um, uh, Human Rights Council, for example, um, because it does make a difference. Um, I think naming and shaming what countries are doing in the international arena can make a difference uh, to how those countries uh, behave in the future. Um, as far as uh, Iraq is concerned, returning uh, to Iraq, I, uh, I mean, as, uh, I can only see really a confederal future for Iraq if it is to survive at all. I don't think it's going to be any tighter than that. The KRG is now functioning, as I've said, virtually as a state. And I think it, from my point of view, it would be regrettable if that were not so. If it also descended into the disorder that there is in other parts of the country and became exposed to extremist movements. So having said that, I think it is probably now the case that a confederal future is the only one. Uh, the Peshmerga and the KRG are holding their own. Uh, I think what they are doing for, you know, all these things are relative, for freedom, <laughs> in that region is on the whole good. I don't justify everything that has been done in their name, uh, but we need to recognize what is relatively good from what is absolutely bad. In the Middle East generally, and I'll finish with this, uh, we are not talking about angels and monsters. We are talking about dealing with different kinds of monsters. This is particularly the case in Syria, the choice is not between angels and monsters, but which monsters you deal with. And ISIS and other uh, movements in Syria are very much worse than, for example, the Assad regime itself. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> We have a few minutes for questions, so we have a microphone coming around. We'll start down here in the front row. If you could please identify yourself as you ask your question, and uh, Bishop Michael will answer. And we'll bring the next microphone here. Yes, Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Fletcher with Daniel Morgan Academy here in Washington, D.C. Your Excellency, could you comment on the status, the activities as you see it, of the Muslim community in, in Britain? It's quite striking how many born and educated yeah. in Britain have turned to, to terrorism and yeah. what, what could you share with us yes. about that? 
Well, uh, I mean, this is uh, relevant to the title of this uh, book that um, Jennifer was uh, referring to. This is why I took that title. One of the main reasons for this is the uh, doctrine of multiculturalism. So multiculturalism was uh, the idea that um, the British uh, people no longer knew who they were. They certainly didn't know uh, who the people were contributing to this new diversity in Britain. And the idea was let people get on with it, to tolerate diversity, to allow communities um, to continue with their communal life um, as, uh, as they wished, and for the government actively to encourage this by providing community centers, by providing financial aid, by having uh, homogeneous educational provision and housing and things like that. Well, you can imagine what happened. What happened was uh, segregated, isolated communities, uh, no lingua franca. I mean, I don't just mean the English language. I mean people talking together about nationhood in a language that everyone could understand. No view of a common citizenship. Uh, and furthermore, this happened at a time, I mean, that is our tragedy, when the extremists infiltrated these isolated, segregated communities and radicalized them. Uh, so, in the late 60s or the early 70s, the profile of the Muslim community in Britain was very much Sufi, pietistic, devotional Islam. By the late 80s, that had changed completely. So multiculturalism has certainly been uh, one reason. Now that has extended itself to the universities and to prisons, which are now uh, very important hubs for radicalization. Uh, by the infiltration and takeover of the so-called Islamic societies, which at one time were societies for Muslims in university, you know, generally, like you might have a Christian union. But they have now, many of them, been radicalized. And then the advent of the internet, of course, means that um, radicalism is in the air, literally, and many young people are now picking it up uh, directly from, from the internet. I think those are the reasons uh, why radicalization has occurred in Britain. What to do about it uh, is another question. I think uh, we must get beyond uh, the multiculturalism discourse to, towards a discourse about better integration of communities related to one another, of educational provision that does not segregate people in that way, I know the word carries baggage here, but I, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. It does not segregate people. Mobility in tertiary education, the expansion of universities, paradoxically, in Britain has meant that people now go to a university in their backyard. So they don't travel away to another place, another uh, context, where they can meet other sorts of people. I mean, that has to be addressed. Um, with the internet, what I say is, you know, what is source for the goose is source for the gander. So if you can have extremist propaganda on the internet, why not, why are moderate Muslims not contributing to their vision of Islam on the internet in a way as to get the attention of young people? I think the, the British involvement in Syria and also the American involvement against Assad, initially may have encouraged young people from Britain to go to Syria. Of course, the British then did not know, neither did the Americans or the French or the Germans, that they would then go and link up with ISIS, which hadn't been thought of at that time. Uh, but this is what has happened. This is again an instance of mutation. And we have to be very careful in who we are dealing with. I mean, again, the angels and monsters thing, that I'm not justifying monsters of any kind, but sometimes it's better to leave a lesser monster alone than to 
create a vacuum where a, a greater monster might emerge. Right here in the front. Hi, I'm Hello. Penny Starr with CNS News. Um, so ISIS is getting larger and larger takeover in Iraq. Um, just today there was an attack where more than 100 people were killed, and I believe ISIS has taken credit for that. Um, if you were to advise the U.S. and the U.K. and other allies how to defeat, defeat ISIS, would it be more boots on the ground, or can it be done diplomacy? What would your advice be to defeat ISIS, both in Iraq and around the Middle East and elsewhere? Thank you. Well, I, I'm not a military expert, um, <clears throat> but um, I, I actually met with the Peshmerga, the, the Kurdish forces that are reasonably effectively keeping ISIS at bay in the north. I think that's probably all that they're doing. They're terribly badly equipped. Uh, the young conscripts, I mean, uh, you know, I was talking to them and drinking tea and so on with them. I think there is a U.S. presence in northern Iraq. Um, I could certainly see it. The Peshmerga say it is not adequate, what is being done to support them. So I think support for people who are themselves willing to fight uh, for their own homes, you know, surely there can be little objection to that. I think the $64,000 question is dealing with Assad. ISIS is a product of, in my view, the causing of unnecessary disorder in Syria. Um, I have known uh, Syria as a nation for a very long time, and there was basically a trade-off in Syria, a trade-off uh, between personal and religious freedom on the one hand and restrictions on political freedom on the other because the Alawite minority regime um, feared the Muslim Brotherhood. And not only feared them, but this Assad's father, Hafiz al-Assad, had uh, taken very severe action against them, uh, which cannot be justified, I mean, uh, but this is payback time. So, um, I mean, maybe change could have been brought about in Syria, but this is not the way to have done it. And I really don't see how ISIS can be controlled unless something happens with Syria, and I can't see anything happening with Syria without dealing with the Assad regime. Now, what the nature of that agreement is can be discussed. But there has to be uh, conversation, there has to be discussion. Uh, so I think those are the two things I would say. All right, this question will make the last. Actually, that was my question. Oh, that was okay. All right. <laughs> Very good. We'll come over here then. Liam Bamford, also of Daniel Morgan Academy. You spoke very positively of the KRG acting as a safe haven for refugees and promoting religious freedom. Uh, and then with your end comments about Iraq might be best off acting more as a confederation, uh, I wanted to ask you about, has there been any push or any idea of potentially forming some kind of Christian state as a counterbalance rather than just being forever persecuted as a minority, or is that simply the cross for Christians to bear in the Middle East? Yes. <laughs> well, of course, there has been discussion, and this is, you know, I talked about the British betrayal, uh, and... Um, when uh, Iraq, uh, in its present form, was being created after the First World War, uh, the British had promised the Assyrians a state of their own. Uh, they, they, uh, they went back on that promise, and in the creation of Iraq, it was explicitly stated that Iraq should be a multi-confessional state, which, of course, it, it was for a long time. Uh, the question is whether we've now reached a stage where the Christians uh, ought to have some form of self-government and some form of protection. Um, the, the Christian opinion, as far as I could tell, is divided on this. Um, I asked the 
the leader of the Chaldean Catholic Church, uh, about the rise of Christian militias, for instance. And he said that they should rather either join the Iraqi army or the Peshmerga. I mean, that was his, his answer. However, I think uh, the demand was, I mean, the more recent demand of the Christians was a governorate on the Nineveh Plains, uh, a semi-autonomous region. Uh, now that the Nineveh Plains have been emptied of Christians, unless they go back in sufficient numbers, I can't really see that happening. Um, the, it is true that the Christians uh, are, and the Yazidis perhaps are the only group who are not protected by militias and fortified cities and villages and so on and are therefore exposed to whoever wants to, you know, do whatever they like with them. And this cannot continue. Um, I mean, I'm not qualified to judge what kind of military involvement the Christians should have, but I think it is entirely justified for them to have a military involvement. All right, will you please join me in thanking Bishop Michael Nazarelli. All right, thank you for joining us, and this will be available on the internet within 24 hours.